40, the percentage was only 15 percent. So among the black... Astounding and, figures, uh, kid. Astonishing figures. And and a majority of, of people on welfare, on, on poverty today, live in female-headed families. The mother has the child at a young age. The mother forced to drop out of school, forced to stay home without any daycare or any kind of support, forced to stay home with the child, therefore forced to go on welfare in many cases. So what you have is, is a kind of a self-perpetuating poverty system or welfare syndrome. And the largest single cause of that, in my judgment, is what is happening to the family. And that is a problem that people in, the, in recent years, uh, let's say the last 20 or so years, have ignored, even though the problem has, has grown by multiples. And feminists tend to think that, and as do many liberals, that you're somehow blaming the victim if you talk about that, which is, is preposterous. Um, and I think, though, I, I must say I'm, I'm slightly encouraged, and I emphasize slightly, because I see some real change in that regard. I mean, there have been a number of... of um, black scholars, uh, Hispanic scholars in, in recent years, uh, who have, and, and, and participants and activists who are really focusing on this problem. The National Urban League, for instance, today is, is talking about one of the three major problems in the country is, is what is happening to the black family. Uh, it's not just the black family, it's the Hispanic family. The white family is also crumbly, but not nearly in the numbers. Not nearly in the numbers, but the Hispanic family you just threw in there. Are their numbers comparable to the blacks? They are among Puerto Ricans. They are not among Cubans and Mexican Americans. Then you, the natural question would be, well, wh why would the different? Why would there be a difference? The same language, and well, there may be cultural factors that may explain it. Uh, Mexico uh, versus Puerto Rico. Another factor that may explain it is the fact that that uh, the Puerto Rican community has been um, victimized by welfare uh, for many for for several generations, whereas the Mexican Americans, the Cubans, and the other immigrants are, are more recent immigrants in our society and maybe in 10 years they will if subjected to the same conditions will have the same results but nevertheless the, the, there's another difference that's very interesting the, the black west indian family is much more stable than the, than the the native black american family even though the black west indian family experienced a form of slavery that in some ways was more ruthless and and savage than the slavery of, of domestic american blacks so within groups, again, the importance of making distinctions, within groups you have to distinguish not only between the Puerto Ricans and, say, the Cubans or the Mexican Americans, but with, within blacks you have to distinguish between Native American blacks and West Indian blacks. Now, as a writer who writes this candidly of the problem, singling out the figures that you've just leveled at our listeners concerning black children born out of wedlock and so on, do you face charges from liberal groups immediately that you're a prejudiced man? I haven't. Um, uh, this book appeared uh, it appeared as a series of pieces in the New Yorker magazine uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, came out on hardcover a year ago and now in, in paperback. paperback yeah. And it's not, uh, I have not been subjected to that. I think in part because what I tried to do in this book was talk to real people. I didn't do this book from an armchair where I talked to the leaders, civil rights leaders or professors. I went out and I lived with this underclass uh, and I interviewed about 300 people and I tried to let them tell their stories. So I think automatically when you, when you confront real people, they're much more sympathetic than they would be if they're abstractions. And I have not been subjected to that, no, which again is I think a healthy sign. For instance, Pat Moynihan, Senator Moynihan, when he wrote a, a family report for Lyndon Johnson back in 65, he was called a racist. And yet, some of the same things he found, the problem is much worse than when he reported to Johnson in 65, and he talked about it as a way of addressing the civil rights question and a way of advancing the civil rights agenda. And I think, I think there's just a much greater awareness, mm -hmm. and I think our politics has shifted, and I'm encouraged by that, that people can talk rationally about a problem. See, once you agree that the, the problem is there, the black family and the Hispanic family, particularly the Puerto Rican family, is crumbling, and that this becomes a predictor of poverty, you still haven't answered the question whether whose fault that is. So people could 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 agree on the facts and, and come to a different conclusion as to the cause of those facts. Where do you go from here? This has been painstaking research for you, clearly. From your talk, you've been absorbed with this problem in the contemporary American society. What's next for you as a writer? Well, I just did a uh, uh, profile which appeared... <laughs> Uh, in June in the New Yorker of a multinational company. I basically, after spending two and a half years with poverty in America, I decided... You went to riches. I decided, <laughs> let's find out how the other half lives, right? 
And uh, I wanted to, I basically was looking to find out why companies fail. And I decided that I would do it by fi asking why a company succeeds. And I asked, what's the it's best the opposite the of the best selling in search of excellence. <laughs> Which is actually a pretty good book, but it's not I human know, enough for me. I to the authors. I agree with you, but it's yeah. marvelously successful. Good. And I found this little-known company called Schlumberger, a um, French-based company, where the president of the company is... It's the single highest profit margin of any major company in the world. I had never heard of it. What lay dealing? Oil service business and information business. Uh, they invented oil well logging back in 1926 and they have now or not without the benefit of the patent they do 70 percent of all the logging every well that is drilled in the world has to be logged first and this company schlumberger did 70 percent of all the logging mm -hmm. and the head of the company for the last 20 years 19 years is a man by the name of jean rebu who is a former french resistance fighter in book and wall was the leader of book and wall camp and calls himself a socialist so it's just a fascinating story, and I spent about a year, a little over a year doing that. Now I'm, I'm in the process of writing a profile of Governor Cuomo in New York, the New Yorker. Why Cuomo? Because he is the governor, that simple? Or? No, he's, he's, a, he's a fascinating character. Uh, he's, a, um, he's smarter than most politicians. He has an anchor more than most. Politics is a business, I think, that, that um, uh, much like entertainment, where, people, where you define yourself by what others think of you. And Cuomo is one of these rare breeds in politics, I think, where he defines himself by what he thinks of himself. He's smart. He, um, he, he's a well-educated former jock, uh, minor league ball player with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Just reading his scouting report the other day, which is kind of interesting. And it's just... It's Couldn't not, throw. That's right. God, you remember all this. It's <laughs> extraordinary. You really do. You couldn't hit home runs either, they said. Well, he could have lived without that. <laughs> when you take a number of basic deficiencies, then you're in trouble. Yeah. He, uh, he, he got beamed and he, he got out of baseball and went into politics. And he's obviously a guy I talked about for national office. It's also a way of, of profiling how government works and, and the government in Albany, which is what I, one of the things I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So are you happy? It's working. Writing is hard work. It's hard work, but it, it's, um, I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, the joy of not just the result when, when, when the piece appears and, and people read it, but the joy of trying to get it right and, and of meeting new people and, and broadening yourself and of, of um, you know, I mean, you just, I mean, here I'm, I, I do the Schlumberger story and I get, I get to the Middle East and I travel around the world and I went to France three or four times and, and, um, Worked on an oil rig for a while. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the things I didn't, I didn't know about this company. I didn't know anything about the oil business. And someone's paying me to do that. Do you have any desire <coughs> deep within you to ever get back into the political scene? Not at all. It's a, it's a business where, you, where, you, where you're not your own boss. And in writing, journalism, uh, I think you are much more so than you are in most other fields. And... I, w I would hate the... Um, out, of, out of all your writing experiences, Ken, would you turn to fiction, do you suppose, at any point? I don't think I have the skill. Um, I, think, I, I think I may lack the imagination. I'm too little-minded for it, I suspect. I mean, it'd be easier in some ways, but I, uh, my guess is that I still find satisfaction doing what I do, longer pieces for The New Yorker and then a weekly column for The Daily News, which gives you a fix on current events if you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, I just don't think I could hold up staring at that typewriter and create. I just don't think, I suspect I don't have that skill. It's good to be able to look at yourself with honesty. That may be the hardest quality for the human race to come by. Self-honesty. Anyway, the underclass is a real social service. I'm glad it's out in paperback, and I'm glad you came by. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. The guest has been Ken Orletta author, as you have heard of the underclass, before that, the streets were paved with gold. I urge you to read it, because it'll be a significant experience for you, educationally and emotionally. The name of the show is Speaking of Everything. This is Howard Cosell for the ABC Contemporary Radio Network. You're in touch with 94FM, WKTI Milwaukee. Mm -hmm.